Good morning. I'm Matt Moore, Mayor of Maitland, West Virginia. I'm honored to be here to introduce today's event on new opportunities for Appalachia's coal impacted communities. We were planning on hosting this event in our wonderful town, but COVID had other plans. Regardless, we're honored to be here today to discuss the challenges and opportunities for Appalachian coal impacted communities like Mate One. I especially want to thank the ARC and the Inner Working Group on Revitalizing Coal and Power Plant Communities for giving us the opportunity to share what's special about our town. With that, I'm proud to give you a virtual tour of Mate One. Roll the video. Mate One is located in Mingo County, West Virginia. And so we sat right on the border of Kentucky in West Virginia, uh, down in the southern part of the state. Mate One definitely has a rich history. I would say it's ground zero for the American labor movement and for the, the fight to unionize in the early 20th century. Mate One is also home to the famous Hatfield-McCoy feud. I think we have one of the most impressive flood walls. The story of Mate One is engraved in the flood wall, so you can see pictures that depict the Battle of Mate One, the Hatfield and McCoy feud, uh, the rise of the coal industry. So Mate One was unique in the fact that it was an independent town built right outside of a coal camp. And it had an elective mayor, it had a chief of police. It wouldn't be like your typical coal town or coal camp. The Mine Wars period, which begins around 1902 and culminates in 1921 with the Battle of Clear Mountain was a series of struggles and strikes for the right to join a union and have a union. In 1921, 10,000 miners marched from Marmet uh, with the destination of Mingo County. They planned to get to Williamson, they never made it and they clashed uh, in Logan County at a place called Blair Mountain up on the ridge where they fought for five and a half days. And 10 years later, the miners would get the right to unionize and uh, the UMWA would become the largest union in America. This is where the Battle of Mate One happened 101 years ago. The depot, the original depot, which was torn down in the late 60s, used to be down this way. After a full day of evicting miners and their families from their coal company-owned housing, uh, they were on their way to catch the train back to Bluefield, which was where their headquarters were. And there was a shootout that happened here. Here we see the actual bullet from 1920, uh, still in the wall 101 years later. So many folks relate to this story because they had family members who are union coal miners or who were a part of the mine wars, or they find the mine wars as inspiration for their work today. So when folks come to Mate One today, I think the first thing that they'll notice when you look at Mate One, it's like a postcard town. They'll see museums, they'll see restaurants, seen several new businesses. I think it's really inspiring to like take an empty storefront and turn it into something like a boutique or a coffee shop. A lot of the success that we've seen has been the result of like the community working together. I think the community should always be in the driving seat of, of preserving history and, and boosting the local economy. As long as we're putting the folks who are impacted the most at the at the front of this, then we're going to be in good shape. Now it's my honor to introduce ARC Federal Co-Chair Gail Manchin. Ms. Manchin is the first ARC Federal Co-Chair to come from West Virginia. Her role as Federal Co-Chair, Ms. Manchin works directly with the ARC member governors, program managers, and a network of local development districts to continue to build community capacity and strengthen economic growth throughout Appalachia. Ms. Manchin. Thank you so much, Mayor Moore, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we are all so happy to be here together, although we would have loved to have been able to be in Mate One together. 
And thank you for the amazing video that really shows the history and the, uh, the rich history and influence that May Wan represents in Southern West Virginia. It's uh, wonderful to be able to welcome today uh, members of President Biden's interagency working group on revitalizing coal and the power of plant uh, communities. We're welcoming people from the White House staff, uh, members of Congress and their staff are with us today, members of local legislators in West Virginia and outside of West Virginia have joined us today and actually people from other states representing uh, coal impacted communities across our country have joined us. So to all of the more than 700 people who have registered to be on this exciting program today where we are going to discuss the challenges as well as exchanging ideas for uh, ex for exciting uh, ways to boost economic vitality in Appalachia's coal-impacted communities and beyond. We're also going to be announcing today uh, the 2021 ARC Power Project Initiative uh, recipients, and uh, that will be exciting for uh, for everyone to be a part of that as well. So again, a, a big welcome to everyone. Uh, thank you again, Mayor, for your gracious hospitality in welcoming us uh, virtually to make one. And now, uh, I'm so proud to introduce and welcome a special message from our U.S. Secretary of Energy, Secretary Jennifer Granholm. She has been uh, a former governor, a, a person that knows and understands uh, across boundaries, um, rural America, urban America, but now understanding coal-impacted communities. And certainly she has been a tremendous supporter of the ARC mission that is all about enhancing vitality and economic development in Appalachia. Welcome, Senator Granholm. Or, excuse me, <laughs> welcome, Secretary Granholm. Thank you so much, Gail and Mayor Moore, for hosting this event and for inviting me. Um, so, if there's one thing you should know about me, it's that I am obsessed with creating good paying jobs in every pocket of the country, including in Maitwan and across West Virginia. So um, I get what happens when a community sees its main industry on its knees. I was the governor of Michigan when the auto industry went bankrupt and was on the brink of collapse. I um, looked into the eyes of too many workers who lost their jobs through no fault of their own. And I, it seared my soul. I will never forget their pain. But in Michigan, through that crisis, because of that crisis, we had built CAR 1.0, but we decided that we were going to embrace CAR 2.0, which is the electric vehicle and the guts to that vehicle, which is the battery. And that shift helped our state to rebound. We started creating jobs again. Uh, we built on our existing supply chain. We matched the same skills that the auto workers already had. So, so I accepted this job as energy secretary on the condition that we do everything in our power to create new opportunities for every worker. And that especially includes the coal workers who have powered our nation for over a century. It's why I was um, really thrilled to visit West Virginia in June, thanks to Senator Manchin, uh, to see for myself the, the unique assets uh, that the state already has and the enormous economic opportunities that lie ahead. I mean, West Virginia did power the country for the past hundred years, and we want West Virginia to power the country for the next hundred years too, but using clean energy. West Virginia can be the poster child for a state that transitioned to providing us with energy 2.0. You, you can be the hub for deploying new technologies. For example, both in decarbonizing the fossil fuels that you have 
and in demonstrating and deploying the clean energy technologies that'll put West Virginians to work well into the future. And that'll keep young people in the state. And you know this, there are, you've been working in this area, there are already glimmers of this future. So when I visited, I saw how West Virginians are building up our domestic supply chains by, by producing the steel and the raw materials that we need to manufacture clean energy here in America. Innov innovators are starting new clean energy businesses that are going to create and, and retain jobs and revitalize local communities. I know that ARC's power grants have supported similar initiatives in the past. Our National Energy Technology Lab, NETL, is pioneering research on, on carbon capture, on geothermal, on clean hydrogen, on critical minerals and more, all necessary to, to, for energy 2.0. And, and from elected officials to the workers that I, I spent an afternoon with down in the coal mine, everybody hopes that this state will power our nation's energy future. People get it. And this administration, totally wants to help and partner with you to seize that opportunity. Over the, over the past several months, just as a start, my department, the Department of Energy, we have been doubling down on funding in West Virginia to create new opportunities for coal workers and their families. For example, at the end of April, we announced $7 million for geothermal research at West Virginia University. I mean, think about that. When you think about uh, going down subsurface extraction of fuels, well, geothermal is subsurface extraction of clean fuels, which is heat beneath our feet. In May, we, we awarded the uh, West Virginia University Research Corporation a million and a half dollars for rare earth element and critical mineral production in fossil fuel communities. Obviously, there's a correlation there. In June, we gave uh, that same group $5 million for R&D on low carbon power plant technology. In total, we've uh, over 127 million now in active projects in West Virginia. We are betting on this state because we know it's a good investment and we want West Virginians to see that a clean energy future pays dividends. There was a recent um, West Virginia University study that found that getting to 80% uh, of emission-free power in this state would spur nearly $21 billion of new investment and put $172 million more every year in the pockets of West Virginians and create tens of thousands of new jobs all over the state. This administration is doubling down on coal and power plant communities. It's why the president established the Interagency Working Group on Coal and Power Plant Communities, led by NETL's own Dr. Brian Anderson, who I know will speak uh, later in this program, who uh, people know well. Um, our inter, uh, governmental work group identified 25 priority communities in the country for a new investment in job creation, including five in uh, West Virginia. And that group is also behind the $300 million in new economic development funds for coal communities that were announced in July. Here at the Department of Energy, I've brought on Kate Gordon as a senior advisor to work directly with energy communities in transition. We've made new investments in industries that, that demand the same skills that coal workers already have, including 75 million for carbon capture and storage, 76 million for geothermal, 36 million for direct air capture, and over $19 million to extract critical minerals from coal ash and other waste streams. So we're turning coal waste into valuable products that can be used in advanced manufacturing. We're working with our partners at DOT and USDA to turbocharge domestic production of sustainable aviation fuels, which are create rural forest jobs and, and require more than 200 new bio refineries across the country by 2050. And yesterday, we announced a new pilot program called Communities Leap, L-E-A-P, where DOE will partner with environmental justice and fossil energy communities like Mate One as they design and implement their clean energy future. 
But all of this is just a down payment for what's to come. Because thanks to the leadership of Senators Manchin and Capito, we now have an historic bipartisan infrastructure deal that are gonna, that's gonna kick all of these efforts into high gear. That deal is, assuming that it's passed, um, it's going to deliver the largest investment in clean energy transmission, the grid in American history, including more than $25 billion for demonstration projects in carbon capture and storage. So to decarbonize fossil fuel uh, power plants, uh, $25 billion for uh, carbon capture, for geothermal, for advanced nuclear, another opportunity for hydrogen, another opportunity for direct air capture, another opportunity and more. And it's gonna de dedicate $21 billion to reclaim abandoned mines, to cap uh, orphaned oil and gas wells, to clean up uh, Superfund and brownfield sites, another huge opportunity for West Virginia. And that bill is gonna invest more than $7 billion for critical mineral projects, including battery manufacturing and direct investments in coal communities. So that bipartisan uh, infrastructure deal is a massive accomplishment that's gonna create jobs and economic opportunity in West Virginia. And then <laughs> to truly boost the state's competitive edge in this 21st century economy, we also need to pass the rest of the president's Build Back Better agenda because that includes the Clean Electricity Payment Program, which will put West Virginians to work up and down the supply chain by incentivizing these clean energy technologies like carbon capture, incentivizing the utilities to install technologies that will remove carbon from fossil fuels. So those plants will have a lifeline and be clean. Um, it'll incentivize geothermal, it in, it'll incentivize nuclear, it'll incentivize hydrogen, also an opportunity uh, for West Virginia. You know, on the table are block grants for state and local governments seeking to deploy these new technologies and tax credits for businesses that use clean energy and that, de that uh, develop it and generate it. You know, it's going to make sure that we and manufacture these technologies here in America with supply chains that are sourced here in America, including Senator Manchin's 48C tax credit, which incentivizes manufacturing, especially uh, for clean energy project, project, projects with um, uh, American made parts and equipment. So we want these jobs created by this Build Back Better agenda to offer family sustaining wages and good benefits and strong protections with the chance to join a union, which is why we're working to attach strong labor standards wherever possible. We've got to get all of this across the finish line to maximize the opportunity for, for West Virginia. So uh, once we do, you, you will see more investment, more dollars, uh, more jobs created and retained in your great state. So I just wanna say I am so bullish on the future of West Virginia. I'm so bullish on y'all being the uh, energy 2.0 uh, pilot project state uh, for how we can power our nation into the future for providing those technologies to the rest of the country for leading us. So thank you so much for having me here today. And I sure wish you a great rest of your meeting. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, uh, Secretary Granholm. Uh, obviously, not only in talking about energy, but just her vitality and passion, she certainly exemplifies energy uh, at every level. So thank you again for joining us here in May 1. Secretary, and we look forward to being able to work with you to see many of these good things come to fruition. And now we are very excited to have many of our uh, community residents and friends right there in May 1 uh, to talk to us, to going to share with you their concerns, their challenges that they're facing and what they feel is needed to boost the economic health of coal impacted communities. So uh, 
if we could go now to our community voice video. The biggest obstacles Maitland has is the promotion of the town. We really should be in every restaurant going up and down the interstate, having a brochure, what Maitland has to offer. We should be on billboards on um, other states to say, hey, come here, come explore our, our small town. No one has any more history uh, than what we do in this area. You've got the mine wars that took place. You've got the Hatfield-McCoy feud. Maitland is a hidden gem. So not really many people know about the history that it holds and how we have access to one of the most beautiful areas, one of the most beautiful rivers, some of the most wonderful history that West Virginia offers. The, one of the biggest opportunities is the unknown stories like Blair Mountain that's not known. You take your bullets out there, nobody ever even knew about. You tell these stories and you tell them well. The trail systems that are now people riding the trails in the area, I think we can grow a little more off of that. The people here, I think, are ready to see Mate One move forward. Um, there's an excitement here in town. Um, with the trail system, we see tour you know, I mean, tourism is more, each year you can see more people coming here to town and they need more things to do. Um, we need to be able to keep them here once we get them here. It's, it's worth it because the people are worth it. You know, we, we, uh, we've we kept the lights on in this here country. We're the heartbeat of the coal industry right in here. And we've kept the lights on in this country for uh, generations. And uh, if not us, then who is worth preserving? And the uniqueness of the area is something that's not found in other places. Uh, you can move or, or do anything you want to do, but the history will stay where it was created at. Tourism is the way to go. We need to be able to provide the children that are coming up jobs here so that they don't have to leave to be able to get a job. Uh, and I think if we can provide them with diversification throughout the community, then they'll have more opportunity to be able to do that. My hope for Mate One is to is to be prosperous again. I am excited to see what lies ahead um, because I know that we have a lot here to offer. Well, my hope right now for Mate One in the future is to see a business in every empty building. We have the setup. We need to create the brand and the atmosphere for the setup and the history that we have here. I want to see a monument that people know who we are and Mate One. They don't know. They really do not know. They haven't had it put to them the way I learned and how special it is. I want to thank our wonderful friends from Maywan for sharing this video and their ideas and their feelings with us. We've always known that the very best part of West Virginia are its people. And so we appreciate uh, our friends sharing with us their stories and their pride in their hometown of Maywan. And now we're going to have a wonderful group of ARC power recipients uh, from coal impacted communities from West Virginia and Kentucky who are going to share what's working in their communities to strengthen and diversify these coal impacted communities. We have included their um, bios on our website link, so we will not uh, take away time for their comments and what they have to share, but you can check there about who they are and, and their wonderful resumes. We are honored to have leading the discussion today, Dr. Brian Anderson, who is the director of our interagency uh, working government committee. And I do think it's important, a couple of things that you need to know about Brian. First of all, he is a longtime resident of West Virginia, but he is also a descendant of coal miners. And he brings to the table uh, an expertise in regional innovation and technology development uh, to the energy 
sector. As a director of NETL, Anderson has worked to unify government research institutes, private industry, and academia behind the goal of delivering safe and affordable energy in an environmentally uh, sustainable manner. Thank you and uh, welcome, Brian. Well, Co-Chair Manchin, thank you so much for the very kind introduction. And I, I will add a little bit, uh, I'm a lifelong West Virginian, and in fact, my uh, my family predates the state of West Virginia by nearly a hundred years, uh, and so it is it is certainly in my blood. Uh, my grandfather uh, worked in, uh, in in the Canal Valley mines uh, in Carbondale. My dad grew up in uh, the coal camp in Carbondale Number Nine, in fact, and and so. This is near and dear to my heart, and as NETL director, um, we are working on the technologies that uh, Secretary Granholm spoke spoke about, uh, the next generation of energy technologies, the ability to decarbonize our abundant fossil energy resources in, in the Appalachian region and in West Virginia in particular, and then additionally developing technologies on adding value to the raw materials. Uh, it's something that I've worked on uh, predating my my uh, tenure at, at the National Energy Technology Laboratory when I was at West Virginia University. A, a focus for us is on how we can take the raw materials, the the assets that we have, including the people uh, that we have in Appalachia and in West Virginia in particular, uh, on today's conversation, and how we can leverage those assets into into more valuable uh, products than than simply just uh, the coal the coal to being burned. I was, it was a great pleasure of mine to be asked by Secretary Granholm, who I hope you all enjoyed listening to her. Uh, by, I was asked by Secretary Granholm and the folks at the White House to take NETL's long historic uh, research and, and innovation. Uh, we've been doing it for 111 years. Uh, NETL has been working in, in the coal sector for 111 years. Uh, but take our expertise and leverage it toward um, revitalizing energy communities around the country. And so uh, she mentioned the, the interagency working group report um, that uh, we released in uh, in April of this year, identifying key communities around the country. And certainly West Virginia is represented 40 of the 55 counties in West Virginia are represented as priority communities for us in this interagency working group. And it's a great pleasure to work with the Appalachian Regional Commission with, uh, with co-chair Manchin, uh, certainly, and, and all of our agencies, the Department of Interior, Treasury, Commerce, uh, it was mentioned uh, that uh, just recently we announced out of the Department of Commerce $300 million specifically focused on coal communities uh, and, uh, and developing redevelopment plans. And so uh, today, uh, it, it's a great pleasure to be joined by a whole series of terrific panelists. They're, they're practitioners, uh, many, many of them power grantees, to, uh, to speak a little on what is working well uh, to strengthen and diversify our economies of coal impacted communities. And, uh, and, and as, as co the co-chair mentioned, please note, you can read their full, bio full bios on the website. I'm going to sprinkle in a little uh, highlights uh, as we go along. But our first panel, uh, uh, Stephanie Tyree, Laura Smith, and, and, and Donna Gambrell, it is, it is really great uh, to, to convene us this morning to talk about recreating vibrant downtowns. And so I don't know if we're, we're ready to have, have our, our panelists join me on the stage, our virtual stage. And as we, as we do that uh, and, and we uh, work through our, our technology, uh, it, is, it is a shame certainly that we're not able to, to sit around a round table today in Mate One. I think it would be a beautiful day to be in Mate One, uh, in fact. And so uh, it's too bad that we're not able to have this, but we're making the most of it. And I'm, I'm so happy to see the hundreds of folks who have joined us today. And, uh, and so I know, I, I know Stephanie's on here too, if we can get Stephanie on the stage, uh, that'd be great. But so, so first of all, in, in this conversation, uh, we, wanna, we wanna have this particular mini panel uh, discussion around recreating vibrant downtowns. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, toss it to you, Stephanie, first. Uh, um, you know, what, what strategies are you seeing that are working uh, in revitalizing downtowns in, in coal country? Sure, thanks, Brian, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for including me in this conversation. I'm Stephanie Tyree, the executive director of the West Virginia Community Development. 
Development Hub. And my organization works with dozens of rural communities across the state of West Virginia with volunteer community leaders, including some of the community leaders that you saw from Matewan to help them identify their visions and do the planning processes to revitalize their communities. And in all of the work, everything that we see, the work drives towards Main Street downtown rural revitalization. That's the heart of our communities. And that's what people wanna to come together and work on together to improve. What we've seen through our work is that there's a lot of similarities across rural communities in West Virginia. Like they talked about in the Matewan video, there's these beautiful historic downtowns, these old buildings that used to hold a lot of vibrant local businesses and really were the center of the community activity. And over the last few decades, there's been a decline in most of those downtowns. And that decline we've seen in some community has led to the demolition of those buildings. And when you lose those buildings, you lose the communities. And so seeing that happen in communities around the state and the region really drives community leaders to understand that there's an urgency to working on redeveloping those buildings to save and to revitalize their downtowns. The challenge is that the market is very challenging to redevelop those buildings. You have to approach it in a very creative way in order to make the financing work for those projects. And my colleagues on here know a lot about that, so I'll let them talk about that. But a couple of things that I'll sort of just mention before we get into the, uh, the heart of the conversation here are just some strategies that we've seen work in rural communities. So the way that the hub works is community-driven and team-based work. We think that when people come together as a diverse team, to think about how to build those redevelopment strategies, you build long-term sustainability and resilience to move through the challenges of doing these projects. These are not easy projects. And for a lot of the communities, it is volunteer community leaders who are becoming development experts in order to revitalize their communities. So you're having to understand a lot of technical information about downtown redevelopment strategies, know which resources to access, which we help with, and there are many resource partners on this event right now that are really deeply involved in this work. And you have to really think across traditional silos in order to make the work work, right? So it's not just about looking at building projects, but it's also about thinking about small business development and entrepreneurial support, community events and activities to people driven into the main town and tourism and other kind of uh, traditional economic sectors, thinking about how all of those layer together to make the creative approach to da developing rural downtowns work. So um, I'll just leave it there for now. I think there's a lot more we can talk about. Uh, Stephanie, thank you. And you, you bring up, um, you know, a, a couple of different thing, threads I want to pull on of strategies. Uh, one's in capacity building, another in, in capital. And so, Donna, you know, how, what are some success strategies that you've seen at, at Appalachian Community Capital in bringing the funding that's necessary, bringing the capital to these projects in downtowns? Thanks, Brian, and and good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. A real pleasure to be on a panel with Stephanie and Laura, who I have not seen in person for quite a while. It will be great when we can reconnect. Um, and share a lot of uh, interesting stories, I'm sure, of what we've seen in the past year and a half. So Appalachian Community Capital is a community development financial institution, CFI. We're a nonprofit lender. Uh, and like the 1,200 other CDFIs across the country, our primary mission is to uh, focus on historically underserved communities, provide the lending, the kind of capital that's needed, as well as uh, grant capital in some cases and technical assistance. Uh, at ACC, our focus is on small business lending and we have 26 high performing members located throughout the Appalachian region. But another critical piece of that is technical assistance. And what we have found, Brian, as part of that successful strategy is that you have to have all of those pieces. You have to have the capital, you have to have 
technical assistance and uh, and you have to have, of course, the communities that are very much engaged and, and certainly in West Virginia and other parts of the region. What we have done in, in stepping out of the way is really providing the technical assistance providers to work with those communities on historic revitalization projects um, that bring the capacity in many cases, or at least add to the capacity uh, of those projects. And I think that that capacity building is so important. You know, it's almost like having a car and you need the gas to drive the car. You have the car, but you really need that fuel. And I think that capacity building piece becomes critical. So just making sure that those components are in place uh, and that people have that uh, support, the technical expertise and the additional knowledge that may be required to really make the projects uh, move forward in a, a very successful way. Um, capital is still king, uh, no matter where you are. And so that becomes an important part of what we do as well is really uh, looking for the, the right types of investors, because we've often said, and I know that Stephanie and Laura agree with this as well, that you cannot uh, just make a one-time investment in redevelopment. You have to be in it for the long haul. And that means a long-term commitment. That means low cost capital in many cases, favorable terms along the way, uh, and really being able to say, we want to see impact, but we know that that's gonna take some time and it's not gonna happen overnight. Donna, thank you so much. I, I, I love the, um, we need to put some gas in the car analogy. And and so Secretary Grenholm mentioned um, some really big numbers in terms of uh, commitments or possible commitments in the federal government investing in coal communities. Um, in our early report, we identified 60 different federal authorities for funding and about $38 billion that we want to make sure we're, we're targeting the right communities. So Laura, you know, I know you, you do you spend a lot of work building integrated teams working on capacity and capital and putting together the the full packages you know I, i'll say from our perspective we want to make sure that communities have what they need to be able to access um you know what what really is a once in a generation once in, in a lifetime in some cases uh, opportunity to reinvest in these communities so so what do you see that's working uh in appalachia uh in building these integrated projects and building integrated teams Great, thank you so much for having me uh, this morning. It's wonderful to be here. So I'm Laura, the executive director of the Appalachian Impact Fund. Uh, we're the first first, uh, first social impact investment fund to exist in Central Appalachia that uses venture philanthropy uh, to do our work. We're anchored at the foundation for Appalachian Kentucky, which is a very non-traditional community foundation that uh, operates as a rural development hub located in Hazard, Kentucky. And that partnership is very, very important because it brings grounded community capacity and leadership development that we integrate into our work with other partners. Uh, first, I just wanna say what I mean by social impact fund and venture philanthropy. Uh, it means we're bringing fair and appropriate and very creative and patient forms of capital, capital to our hardest to work in coal impacted communities. Uh, through catalytic grant making that we then blend and integrate with impact investments from an evergreen revolving loan fund. Uh, we've supported small businesses and entrepreneurship, social enterprises and promising sectors, affordable housing, and many downtown revitalization projects at this point. Um, ARC was one of our first investors, and I'm very uh, appreciative and we're very proud of that. Uh, through our power grant, uh, which is around revitalizing downtowns, uh, we saw the momentum that was happening and really wanted to focus on entrepreneurial driven downtown revitalization that was happening throughout the region. Uh, we've accomplished that again with building partnerships. Um, our partnership with the Community Economic Development Initiative for Kentucky, CEDIC, um, they organize communities and bring expertise to do deep dives around downtown planning. And then AIF is able to supply that access to affordable capital to get those uh, projects that are identified through that planning process actually done. Within Foundation for Appalachian Kentucky, providing that backbone support and leadership development at a very local and deep level. Um, what we've learned is that the cultivation of local leadership and community capacity is really key. Often communities um, that we found start 
uh, with thinking that they need money, particularly grant money. They've identified a building or a project that they want to do, and they jump straight to the grant part. Uh, but what they really need first that we found is that solid strategic plan and the organizational and community capacity, and most important, really dedicated, rooted, in it for the long haul, local leadership in place to pull off that plan. Then the investment can come. I often say that capital flows to the path of least resistance. I use the analogy a lot of times of it's like water flowing down a mountain. So you have to create those channels, those investable opportunities that are viable and good investments. And our, in our poorest communities, uh, we've needed this nimble and flexible venture uh, philanthropy capital to pull that off. So from the heart of our little office in Hazard, Kentucky, in one of the uh, poorest subregions of Central Appalachia, I want to tell you guys that it's totally possible. And what we found is that mixing strategic planning at the municipal level, access to technical assistance, and then this creative, affordable, very patient capital uh, that comes in the form of both grant dollars and low interest lending has been a successful recipe for us for creating um, the thriving communities and downtown projects that we're seeing now. Laura, thank you so much. And a quick plug in terms of you, you were saying you need to plan. Um, right now, $100 million on the street. Due date is October 19th. Economic Development Authority grants are, are, are out on the street. Um, we have some EDA folks on, on today. You can uh, email me or, or my Deputy Director Briggs White for, for some more information, but just that quick plug. I want to I want to dive very quickly um, because I have the hard job of, of shutting off a panel. I you know I could talk with you guys for the, the rest of the day, um, but quickly, what are our region's best assets? And so I don't know who who wants to jump in. Maybe Stephanie, what what do you think the the best asset of the region is? Well, um, I often just talk about how inspiring it is to me to work in West Virginia. Like you, Ryan, I'm from West Virginia, and it's a real privilege to get to do this work in my home. And it seems a little cliche to say this, but I, I, our best assets that drive me every day and that I see in the hub's work are the community leaders that we work with. It isn't easy to do this work in rural communities. It is much easier to like lead if you have the option. And the community leaders that are committed to doing this work are committed because they love their communities and they see the potential of the redevelopment that can come to their communities and they know how special these places are but they have to work through innumerable hurdles every single day to keep the work moving forward so i think it's community leaders but also there's just incredible partnerships around the region and there's real trust in the partnerships in the Appalachian region and Central Appalachia in particular, which I think is unique and that we need to lean on as much as we can. Um, the last thing that I wanted to make sure to uplift before we have to get um, pushed off the stage here is that to me, it is really important that ARC is starting today's conversation with this conversation about downtown revitalization. ARC has a a 50 plus year commitment to workforce and economic development and infrastructure development. But we all know that economic development is grounded in community development. Businesses and workers are going to communities that they want to live and uh, be placed in. And uh, those communities are vibrant communities. So community development downtown re revitalization, community capacity building, it's all the really foundational elements of economic development. And when we see that as a whole pie that works together, that's when we can really break through some of these persistent generational challenges that we're all working on together. Thanks, Stephanie. And, and Donna, how, how do we best capitalize on the assets that we have in the region? Well, I think you see it already. I mean, Stephanie's talked about the local leadership I certainly see that as one of the strengths. Uh, and, and, and I think the partnerships uh, are also important. I think we have seen that in our own projects, uh, Opportunity Appalachia, where you had local leaders, community leaders, business leaders, developers, universities, all coming together who already had a strategic plan, had a sense of where they wanted to take uh, the, the particular uh, area or the particular project. What they needed was that additional uh, supplemental 
uh, technical assistance, if you will, uh, what Laura has talked about as well, looking at that strategic plan and refining it and really making it match uh, the needs of the community. So I, you know, I think, again, I think we, we need to recognize our own values. There is tremendous value in this region. There's a tremendous <laughs> entrepreneurial spirit uh, and there is just this uh, desire to harness all of this energy and move forward. Uh, and I think you're going to see it. I think there's just this uh, great uh, trajectory right now. And I always say, seize the moment. We're here. We need to do it. Donna, thanks. And, and Laura, I'm going to give you the last word. I love your comment in the chat. So please make sure everybody hears it. Yeah. So um, invest in your young people. Um, you know, Stephanie is an example of that. I'm, I'm from Eastern Kentucky originally and had the opportunity to move back home after college and grad school. Invest in young people folks and create the opportunities within your organizations, uh, within the entrepreneurial landscape for them to, to stay or return home and create, you know, wonderful lives here. Uh, well, thank you all so much. Uh, Stephanie, Laura, Donna, thank you for this conversation. Again, I, I could, I really would love to have it go on, but I know Donna, you have, you have somewhere to go and, and uh, as well. So, uh, thank, thank you all so much, and, and I, this was a great way to, to kick off uh, uh, our, our little mini panels. And so we're going to shift to our next topic, uh, is strengthening emerging sectors. But before we, before we do, we're going to share a video from App Harvest on some innovative ways that they're growing the ag tech industry in Appalachia. CBS News senior environmental correspondent, that's Ben Tracy, traveled to Kentucky to meet a pioneering young farmer who's also giving his Appalachian community an economic boost. We build big. This rectangle of steel and glass stretches for nearly half a mile. And just as you start to take it all in, you realize that's only the half of it. When we do something and we put our mind to it, we go massive. Jonathan Webb used to build solar energy projects for the government. It's like surfing, coming down here. Now the 35-year-old is running one of the largest indoor farming operations in the world, growing row after row after row of tomatoes. This greenhouse is the size of 58 football fields, so big you can't see where it ends. Do you think of yourself as a farmer? Yeah, th this is farming. Calling it app harvest isn't just clever tech talk. It's located in Appalachia just outside Moorhead, Kentucky. Everybody watch out for Central Appalachia. We're absolutely gonna be one of the largest fruit and vegetable suppliers of the U.S. in the decades to come. Climate change is not only altering our weather patterns, but it's changing where and how we grow our food. A lot of our produce comes from California and Mexico, two places now hit with frequent and devastating droughts. Kentucky is getting wetter and has location on its side. You got it. Webb Rock believes roll, he and his orange army are building a new future for Appalachia. It's a runaway freight train. Now, now it's a matter of how big is it going to be, how fast are we going to go. And that's saying something, given how big it already is. We at App Harvest have set a goal to, to be one of the largest food and agriculture producers in the world. We have a workforce that is unmatched. One of the world's largest agritech greenhouses in Moorhead, Kentucky. First of all, I love the flavor. Mmm, they are so good. We're not stopping construction for 10 years. In this community, we're going to have one of the largest strawberry facilities. We're building a 10 acre leafy green facility. Our second 2.8 million square foot facility. Site Selection Magazine ranked us number one in our region in economic development with over five potential projects that would be a billion plus in investment. Moorhead is a shining example of what's possible. So certainly some ex exciting uh, goings on from, uh, from App Harvest and, and some, some real food for thoughts, and sorry for the pun, um, but they're probably not gonna end. I'm gonna bring up the next panel uh, if we can ask Brandon, uh, Jenna, and Mary uh, to the stage, what we want to talk about are emerging sectors, be it agriculture, be it uh, uh, new renewable. Uh, Brandon, I, I know uh, you and, and, and the folks 
uh, in, in your shop are working on lots of different opportunities. So I'm going to start with you, Brandon, if you don't mind. Um, what are some of the most promising emerging opportunities in, in the region? What do you think some low hanging fruit might be? I think uh, we, we've seen a lot of great examples today, but my mind always goes to climate resilience, which is sort of a, a as an umbrella. Um, I, I think climate change is a defining challenge of our generation, but it's a defining economic opportunity as well. And I think central Appalachia is very well positioned to be a leader on that. So a lot of times when we talk about the transition uh, from being so, so heavily coal dependent, we're sort of thought of as, as this, this problem that has to get figured out, you know, we gotta, we gotta help those people out. Whereas really, I think we're an asset to be leveraged to figure out what this new economy looks like. The thing about the Appalachian workforce, we don't mind to get dirty. We don't mind to roll our sleeves up. I think we can, we can retrofit the buildings. We can manufacture the products. We can grow the local food. We can reclaim the mine lands, install the solar systems and, and really take the lead on climate resilience. Um, and, and so that's where I, I see the most opportunity. I think local agriculture is a part of climate resilience. I think renewable energy, solar, wind, geothermal is a part of climate resilience. I think a huge chunk of the construction industry could fit into climate resilience. I think even something like ecotourism uh, can fit into to climate resilience. So I, I too am feeling very bullish on the future of Central Appalachia and just inspired to to be on stage with all these amazing leaders and entrepreneurs. Well, Brandon, thank you. And 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 uh, as the name implies, in coal field development, I think that there might be some opportunities um, in using and leveraging what we've built out in terms of infrastructure in our coal fields, infrastructure, human infrastructure, physical infrastructure. Uh, so I want to pass it uh, quickly now now to Jenna. What where might we see the opportunities in? Uh, our coal power plant uh, energy regions in some of these emerging uh, emerging clusters and, and what clusters do you think would be poised for growth on the backs of our existing coal field communities? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Brian. Um, I appreciate being on the panel today. Um, so NRGRDA is the largest EDA representing Southern West Virginia in really the coal fields. And so what we're seeing is a real uptick in the ability to transition our existing energy sector in and just sort of focus on um, some new industry clusters in aviation and aerospace, but also outdoor manufacturing. Um, so specifically with aviation and aerospace, we see and the ARC has proven and, and done a lot of work to pull data that identifies the transferability of skills from the coal industry worker into the aviation maintenance and manufacturing worker. Um, so we've partnered um, to sort of just create that holistic approach to economic development with both um, traditional um, recruitment opportunities, building out infrastructure for the aerospace industry, but also partnering with some of our local community and technical colleges to develop those AMT programs that will retrain those coal industry workers. And the livable wages are very much um, on par with those of the coal industry workers. So we recognize um, the, the clear ease of, of transferability into that sector. Additionally, um, you know, we talk a lot about tourism and tourism has is an existing industry, right? But what we want to really capitalize on is the outdoor economy as a whole. And what that means is bringing in outdoor manufacturing into the region and then also supporting the entrepreneurial um, growth and quality of place that we just talked about on the panel before so that the visitors that come here for the tourist experience see the opportunity to stay here and grow. So um, that's really our focus in the outdoor industry. And then finally, um, NRGRDA recently announced some of our priorities to focus on a coal to products initiative in Southern West Virginia. We recognize, um, again, going back to aerospace, there's a lot of use for those coal byproducts to develop, um, to develop new products in aviation and in outdoor manufacturing, as well as um, building materials that we're seeing an incredible shortage on. So we're focusing on working in a lot with a lot of organizations in Southern West Virginia 
um, to really see how we can prioritize utilize, utilization of those coal byproducts to commercialize and create a coal to products initiative for Southern West Virginia and beyond. So again, to us, that really looks like diversification of the coal industry rather than away from the coal industry. And so we're really looking forward to seeing that business cluster grow um, in Southern West Virginia, especially with the identification of the feedstocks we have here. Well, Jenna, thank you so much. And you, you know, uh, most of the people in here know that the coal products uh, space is something near and dear to my heart. And then folks, if you don't realize, uh, Touchstone, uh, Touchstone Industries in Northern Panhandle in West Virginia is manufacturing from coal, uh, carbon foam castings for the defense aerospace industry. Some of the most high tech uh, things you can you can build from coal. And at NATL, we can make graphene from coal at very low cost. But Mary, um, you know, Jenna talked uh, talked a little bit about the outdoor industry. I know that the Benham Foundation does everything from. Uh, investment in tech and capacity building and the outdoor industry. And so what do you see from the Benedict Foundation as some other emerging clusters that we might have in, in Appalachia? Um, thanks, Brian. And um, I'm happy to be here with everybody else on the panels. This is, uh, you know, a really good brain trust of people thinking about the future of central Appalachia. So it's good for everybody to be talking like this. Um, you know, I think um, we, we are talking about these opportunities, you know, the, the idea of coal to products um, has not been, a, it's not been a sleeping issue. As you mentioned about Touchstone, they received their first SBIR many years ago, and that is, uh, can be then, you know, expanded into other applications. And so those are some of the things that we have a lot of the baseline assets here in West Virginia and, and in Central Appalachia, speaking more broadly, and building upon those baseline uh, relative to things like energy efficiency in a large way, uh, you know, and, and looking at things like solar on abandoned mine sites and agriculture on mine sites. These are all things that we've been doing for and investing in. I know the Benedum Foundation, if I look back at my, uh, at the portfolio that we have 20 years, we've been looking at how can we use these assets, either physical or geographic assets and, and build them into economic, uh, stronger economic opportunities. And those are the things I think we're seeing um, set up for the additional investment that's coming through both that, that has come through with these power grants, but also through the other federal and private investment that we've been talking about. You know, outdoor recreation, that's, you know, is one key asset. When we look at our juxtaposition in the population center of the east of the United States, and what people want, I mean, we've seen through the pandemic, what people can do is be outdoors and enjoy the outdoors with family and friends and safely do that. And just the migration to, to our places are very um, beneficial to us. Yet we have to make the opportunity into an economic growth opportunity. And so that's where things like the small downtowns and boutiques and services and lodging and food and other things that make up our culture uh, can fold in and we can still be us in central Appalachia and, and the people that we are and be the culture that we are, not just the history, but the current culture that we are. Good towns, good people, nice small towns, and still be prosperous, which was the term that was used earlier, with this additional investment and good planning. So those are just some ideas. Oh, Mary, Mary, thank you so much. And next, I want to ask Brandon. Um, I know that the Coalfield Development and, and you have, have thought a lot about, um, you know, individual technologies, uh, the clusters that might be built out, uh, and then regional strategy. So how is it that, uh, because one, there's, you know, there is only a finite amount of capital and it's also a competitive environment. Um, you know, we need to find the um, competitive advantage that our communities have, that our region has. So Brandon, what, what are some thoughts around how we develop a regional strategy and then execute on that regional strategy? I want to build off the point Stephanie made in the previous panel when she was talking about these community projects, how important they are, but also how difficult they are. Um, and, and a lot of times I think economic development, it, it's, it's tough because we do need to grow and develop new markets, new sectors. So it's not quite as cut and dried as, you know, identify a demand and supply that demand. Sometimes we're really trying to develop demand and supply at the same time because the goal's got to be grow the whole pie. 
And I think sometimes during tough economic times, uh, and certainly in, in the funding world, we sort of get trained to, to fight over slices of this pie that seems to be getting smaller and smaller. And at the end of the day, that's never gonna get us where we want to go. Um, so the idea is how do we grow whole new markets, tap buyers and supply chains outside of central Appalachia and start bringing wealth back into Appalachia and then recirculating that wealth locally. So I think as practitioners and community leaders, local government nonprofits, we, we got to know we're all on the same team here. Um, I, I think strategy wise, we got to know, you know, we got to do a couple different things at once. Uh, if, if, if we're, if we get tunnel vision and silo ourselves on, on just our project or just this one sector, then we're not really achieving the, the diversification that's needed. And we're back where we started, which is overly dependent on one sector. So a lot of times pe people in the media ask me what's going to replace coal. And it's totally the wrong question. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it, it really needs to be, how do we build a new diversified, strong economy with lots of different kinds of opportunities for lots of different kinds of, of people. The last thing I'll say, you know, we are a part of CAN, the Central Appalachian Network, which is, which works across state lines for 25 years, highly valuable. I know the Appalachian Funders Network has been working across uh, state lines for, for more than 10 years now. So certainly, you know, we can be working county to county, but we can be working across the state lines as well as, as one Appalachia. And I think we're, we're playing a much stronger hand when we do that. Uh, Brandon, thank you. I, I think, you, you know, one thing that you touched on is, is tapping into supply chains. There's an evolving industry, a set of evolving industries as we go through the energy transition. We also, Secretary Granholm mentioned the electrification of the vehicles fleet, and we see lots of commitments. The automotive, the automobile is going to change. And so as that changes, there, the supply chain is going to modify. And we're not that far off from the central supply chain uh, in automotive. And Jenna, what, what are some thoughts? I know in aerospace, we're, we're in there, automotive. You know, what are some of those other clusters that we can build and grab and grow that pie um, for Appalachia? We talked about, we've talked about outdoor a lot today. Um, and so what has really worked well for us is looking and partnering up with the folks down in Asheville, North Carolina to see what they've done um, and how they've built out their branding components and um, and really sort of take a step back and see that we're a few steps behind them. And so we can benefit from supporting them in their efforts, but then also uh, molding them and mimicking them here in our region to create a larger approach again across those state lines. Additionally, one of the components that we're really interested in building out in Southern West Virginia is um, we are working to identify how the textiles industry plays into the outdoor industry. So we're talking with the folks down in the Carolina textile district to see how we can duplicate those efforts here to serve, you know, both the outdoor industry as well as others that have those textile needs. So I do think that there are benefits. I always like to tell my staff, um, you know, we're not thinking of anything brand new. Someone else somewhere has done it. So let's find that someone else somewhere and figure out how that we can, they can support us in launching that here in our region. And then we can then in turn um, support them as they continue to grow their programming as well. Um, so, and then also just to Brandon and Stephanie's point, um, inside West Virginia, you know, we are a regional organization, but we work way outside of our, bound, our four county boundaries. And we recognize that when we're trying to create an economic impact, it doesn't just boil down to recruiting a company um, and hoping that they create those jobs. So we lean on folks like Coalfield for workforce development. We lean on folks like the hub to help with community capacity building because that workforce for that company that we recruit has to have quality of life. They have to have childcare facilities. They have to have a ready workforce. They have to have those outdoor amenities like trails while they're living here and staying here. So it does take, again, that thinking about that bigger picture and not trying to recreate the wheel in a silo, but working with the resources we already have in the state and outside the state. Uh, Jenna, thank you. Thank you for saying that. That's one of the mission points uh, within the interagency working group. Our 25 communities span the entire country on Tuesday. We were in uh, the Navajo and Hopi nations in Arizona. Last week, we were in Colorado, we were in North Dakota. We're trying to take some of the best practices from around the country and make sure that they're, they're spread out. And, and Mary, uh, last question, the Benedum Foundation, you know, it does have a footprint, it's bigger, 
uh, than, than just West Virginia. And the Appalachian Regional Commission, just as a, as a heads up, we have representatives from all 13 ARC states on, on this call today. But how can the Benetton Foundation help with moving some best practices across your own region? Well, our region is southwestern Pennsylvania and West Virginia, but we like to expand that even in, because we see ourselves as a citizen of central Appalachia and Appalachia as a whole. So uh, one of the things we did do, as Brandon mentioned 10 years ago, is to help participate in the founding of the Appalachia Funders Network. And and while you know many of the funders, um, mostly philanthropic, but uh, some public funders at all, most of those are very small. But they can lead by uh, be thought leaders, by early research, by demonstration projects, by combining their resources for things like Invest Appalachia, a new venture investment fund, and the work that Donna Gambrell is doing with the Appalachian Community Capital, coming together as sort of the uh, the the thought leaders, the early investors from a philanthropy standpoint, can help bring resources both from the private sector as well as the public sector with a lower level of risk and a higher level of outcome at the earlier stages. So that to me is where both philanthropy and that has a larger footprint, but also combining philanthropy and public and private investment helps um, bring ourselves into this new day in Central Appalachia and Appalachia, where we do have to reinvent and think and pivot as we've heard both Jenna and Brandon talk about. And that investment allows that risk that comes into that pivot to be reduced and thus hopefully accelerate into um, prosperity as we talked about more. So I think that, you know, philanthropy has an important role. We call it small but mighty maybe because we also um, don't have the ability to take most things to scale, but we can work with those that do. And uh, that partnership is, is important uh, for success in this region, I think. Well, Mary, thank you so much. And Brandon, Jenna, and Mary, thank, I, I really appreciate it. I seriously, sincerely could do each one of these panels all day. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time. I hope folks are having fun. This is this is really enlightening. And and again, thank thank you so much. And Mary, we'll see, we'll see you back on another panel later, but, uh, but thank you all so much. So again, shifting gears, uh, Quickly, we are virtually uh, in Matewan, and, and really a, a tremendous thanks to, to everyone in, in Matewan for uh, virtually hosting us, and, and uh, we we really want to be um, uh, really want to be there. Matewan is is a, really a birth of, of the nation's labor movement, and and next it's about talking about a competitive work uh, competitive workforce, and so inviting to the stage uh, Jim King, Josh Sword, and Elizabeth Manuel. Uh, to have a conversation over the next 15 minutes uh, around uh, our competitive workforce. And in many respects, as, as Brandon said in the last panel, Appalachian workers are not afraid to roll up their sleeves, get their hands dirty, and build things. And so, uh, you know, we have that as an asset. But, Jim, can you speak a little bit to what are some of our region's major barriers to employment and, and how can we overcome them? Um, you know, I never want to be the person that has to answer the question about what's in the way, um, because I do think, I mean, I do think as, as we've heard from the other panels, I mean, it, it, the, we do have, we have tremendous people and, uh, we have tremendous leaders and, and I think, um, just to go back to this, this idea of, um, where, where employment comes from is that we have, we have places that, that, that have to have some investment and they have to have leadership. And I think those two things go hand in hand. Leadership that's supported with capital and expertise, I think is, um, is critically important. Um, and, uh, and we need investment we need investment, I think at scale so that those leaders have the resources that, that are necessary um to to connect to um ultimately to build to build employment that that connects to i think real capital flows um and and then i would also say that um um the the scale matters and so one of our barriers is sometimes that we um we think too small uh at times about what ought to get done and where we ought to, what kind of investments we ought to go after and what that ought to accomplish. And we don't always, we don't always look outside of our, our, 
our community to look at uh, how do we build this at a regional level. I think earlier, uh, Brandon mentioned, you know, multi state and going across state lines and county lines and things and. Um, we have it, we have issues around employment, I think, that are at scale. And so we need to think about how the money, uh, the investment of time, and how we coordinate with one another um, really brings that money in and plugs it to work so that so that we're taking advantage of that, um, you know, our collective work. Um, and I I do think it, the scarcity mentality, and that's not that's not germane just to to Appalachia. Uh, it, it, when when it feels like we're fighting for sort of like you know our piece of the pie, what we need the reason it matters to me when we think about collaboration is that that this is about not my community going to scale or yours. It's about us going to scale together and building. I think the life that 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 everybody wants. Well, Jim, thank you for that. I, and I'm probably going to I want to come back to this uh, point about investments and investments in people. Just as a side note, the interagency working group, in addition to Treasury and Commerce and DOE and Interior, Health and Human Services, Education, and, and the Department of Labor are all part of our interagency working group. And we want to hear what types of investments those agencies need to make. And so I'm going to come back to that. Um, but uh, the, quickly, as I, as I move, Elizabeth, you know, tell us about the role of um, education and community and technical colleges and how we can even strengthen that role in revitalizing our workforce in conjunction with the economies. I mean, they go hand in hand, but, but tell us a little bit about that role. Thank you. Um, and I, what an honor to be able to um, be with you all today um, to have these conversations. And so I come from the state's higher education system, working with both the community and technical college system, as well as the higher education policy commission. And I have about a decade of experience in working in workforce and economic development at the community college level. Um, but we do, we know a well educated workforce. It's, it's important to our communities and the state's prosperity. We believe that states can build a strong foundation for economic success by investing in education. Uh, providing expanded access to high quality programs throughout the pipeline from trades all the way through graduate school. These opportunities for residents help strengthen not only um, uh, the work being done within the community, but helping to also build a competitive workforce. And so we know that community colleges consist of more than solely influencing the students' lives, but programs that colleges offer uh, within those communities support a range of industry sectors and uh, supply employers with the skilled workforce that they need. And so we do know that there's a shortage. Um, that's why in West Virginia, we have our attainment goal, the West Virginia climb, and it's our campaign to equip 60% of West Virginians with a certificate or degree by 2030. And um, it's not just something that will take the higher education system working together, but as we were talking about the, the entire pieces of the, all of the pie, it's going to take the entire bulk of the sectors to help create career pathways, from CTEs at the high school level through the entire education continuum. And uh, we know that one of the things that's so important, very important, is that we start having these conversations earlier with students, even at the elementary level. So working with your K-12 system, it's important for higher education institutions, specifically community and technical colleges, to focus on initiatives that can bring everyone to the table to allow us access to work with those students and have those conversations at an early age, because those are the students are those are the individuals that are going to uh, fill our workforce in years to come. And so, just as an example, in West Virginia, we have a college application exploration week each year, and we have about 400 schools from elementary through high school that participate in this initiative, and the majority of those percentage wise our elementary schools, and it's kind of been um, a national model. Um, and what we were able to do through that initiative is really have those conversations early on and our institutions within the state, both four year and two year, are able to get on board and help with these uh, efforts and work with the, st the schools. And again, have those conversations early uh, with, with students. So it's important that we start working with students at an early age so that we're able to help meet the demands as as time goes on um, and get those students equipped and ready to go into those skill programs 
and you know, starting out with certificate programs and then those stackable skill sets, they can build up on those. And um, the way that we're able to work with um, employers in the state, the partnerships, meeting the demands that they have in order for us to be able to customize. Uh, I think that's one of the things that community colleges offer is being able to customize training programs uh, for employers in the region uh, where they're embedded and help meet those workforce demands. Elizabeth, thank you. And, and you know, certainly getting the robust pipeline to, of, of trained and, and, and hardworking workers. I mean, we, in the state of West Virginia has, I think the best workforce uh, retainment rate in, in the country uh, when it comes to uh, uh, low turnover uh, when employers hire our folks. And, and so, Josh, uh, if we could speak a little bit to how we uh, leverage that pipeline uh, to the talented workers that we have speaking from abundance in Appalachia um, to then develop and, and cultivate our future leaders and connect our workforce to uh, new industry and, and bringing and attracting new industry to the region. Well, thank you, Brian. Good morning. Um, uh, uh, what a great opportunity. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be on this panel. And I also want to say, you know, as president of the West Virginia AFL-CIO, I may be a little biased on this, but I think President Biden made a great choice for co-chair of ARC with the appointment of Gail Manchin. Uh, I've got to start with union apprenticeship and training programs. I think it's a model that, you know, others are trying to replicate and it makes sense. Um, they are producing, you know, the high skilled uh, workers in their crafts and it, it works well because of the relationship we've heard of this throughout uh, the speakers today, the relationship and the coordination between the employees and the employers is critical. Uh, without that, it would not work. Uh, we wouldn't have welders. We wouldn't have highly skilled, highly trained welders and crane operators and electricians, et cetera. Uh, so I think that's the model that, that, that will work and help us through this transition, whatever it looks like. But, but I have to say, I was listening to uh, Secretary Granholm's remarks and you know i too am a little bullish about opportunities moving forward and uh you know look i know we've got a ways to go uh, but i feel confident that just like the coal miners 100 plus years ago in the mine wars which ultimately led to the greatest uh union organizing movement in the history of the world uh, without that happening we wouldn't have a united auto workers we wouldn't have uh, steel workers, we wouldn't have communications workers of America, the mine workers, you know, uh, help fund, put the seeds for those organizations to prosper. And as a result, we have a really strong labor movement and affiliate, all of our affiliates are providing training to their membership on a, on a regular basis. So I, I listened to Secretary Granholm talk and I thought all the opportunities, yeah, the work may be, look a little different. Uh, I, I have no doubt that if manufacturing takes off and it must for West Virginia and the Appalachian region to prosper, it's going to look different than it did 30 or 40 years ago. But we have a resilient workforce in Appalachia. I'm confident that we can step up and meet that demand. We just want the opportunities and, and in order for it to work and to work well for these communities to prosper. We're not talking about, you know, low wage jobs with no benefits here. They have to be good middle class jobs with benefits that can sustain families. And uh, once we get those opportunities, and I think we're going to get them, then I feel really optimistic about you know uh, the future for worse workers, not just in West Virginia but the Appalachian region. Josh, thank you for that, and thank you for that. And and I will say the Appalachian workers are were uh, resilient, and and in fact, you know, my my first job. Uh, was in the aluminum plant at Century Aluminum. Previous to that, Kaiser Aluminum that was my first job, and and I've my career is adapted, and I'm sure lots of lots of workers across Appalachia are adaptable as well. Uh, I want to do a, a quick round on where some necessary investments are in people and the workforce. Um, and so, Jim, I'm gonna I want to pass it back to you quickly. Um, you know. What are your some thoughts on some much needed investments in, in people in the workforce? Well, um, um, I, and I'm happy to go to more specifics, but I mean, I think if I, if I put it 
if I put it just a, 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 almost at a cliche level, uh, investments have to be um, uh, predictable and they have to come on a flow. Um, and then one one reason that um, that we see uh, community struggle or community based organizations struggle is because they're tied to money that turns on and off, right? Like like federal funds, uh, you can't have just a steady diet of that. When I when I think about capital, I do think about what attracts the private industry, you know, private capital and those flows. And um, and predictability matters. Um, the uh, the and and cash can't come and go easily. A, the one of the one of the premises we work on, and we are a community development financial institution, as uh, as Donna Gambrell mentioned that they are as well at Appalachia Community Capital. But at Fahi, that's what we do. We deploy about 175 million dollars a year as a CDFI. And we have a field of membership, and so together we're 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 impacting communities at about four hundred million dollars a year, um, and that's what we see happen. We see that happen across the region, uh, in in communities and across communities, um, and um, and so it. The the industries that I think that are upon us right now, I, when we look at infrastructure, the infrastructure bill and all the money coming for things like affordable housing. And so really thinking about building things right now is in the short run um, and having that labor force that can build, not just build anything, but to build at a cutting edge for an energy economy. Uh, I think we can lead the way uh, coming from Appalachia, and we're seeing that, um, and we seeded some of that work uh, with 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 one of our power grants. Um, I think that has t that has a ton of potential, and it takes advantage of things we already have in place, and it connects to capital flows that are predictable, whether that's housing, healthcare, infrastructure, downtown revitalization. They all work on a similar premise, right? And the delivery is there. Uh, if we if we just if we just cultivate, I think the workforce. I think that that's the economy we have, and that gives us time to really work on some of these things that take more time. When we talk about like developing young people and and the right education for the future, or uh, entrepreneurial um, active you know um, ideas that take a little more time. Um, so so when I think about capital and right now, I see what's coming from from the federal side. That we can tap into that will connect easily to, uh, I think, uh, the private capital markets that that'll help us take things to scale. Inevitably, I leave myself on mute. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Uh, Elizabeth, um, quickly, how do we make the connection between our community and technical colleges, and some of that predictable capital that Jim was talking about? You know, I know that uh, in some of our community colleges, we we have great programs where it's 100% placement. So how do we make sure that we're making the investments in in the in that system to build the pipeline and make the connection to the private sector pool? Certainly, I think that um, it's important to invest in partnerships. And in one year alone, the community and technical college system was able to deliver more than 797,000 hours of uh, training and had more than 700 partnerships that were established and that was through local business and industry and um, so I think it's very important that we there's awareness around what the community college can do within those communities and can do in partnership with uh, local businesses um, specifically customizing training to meet their needs and I think investing in education in terms of, um, you know, how, how do the students pay for their tuition? And so in West Virginia, we also have the West Virginia Invest Grant. And um, it's a state funded program that covers the full cost of basic tuition fees. And just recently they've uh, voted to include additional to pick up some additional fees for students. And so that is allowing students who go to a community and technical college and enter into one of those demand, high demand uh, occupations to have their, their training paid for. And I think that if we can get the word out that, that that is available even to our employers, that if they have employees that they would like to kind of move up along the ladder, um, that those opportunities are out there for them. And so I think it's, you know, a, a, I say like a triangle working with 
higher education, our K-12 system, at least from our standpoint, and also business and industry, and how we can provide programming that's going to meet the needs to take to, to meet the demands for 21st century workforce. Um, and whenever we are able to you know, move those students through that education pipeline, and they come out with certificate programs, they come out with degrees, they come out with all those stackable skill sets, many of them, you know, then we're able to present that to outside entities to maybe even come in and bring more industry and business into within the state, within the Appalachian region. Um, so. Oh, Elizabeth, thanks. And, and, and Josh, uh, you know, it's a, a real commitment uh, from the administration uh, to uh, family sustaining jobs. You heard Secretary Granholm say family sustaining jobs, unionized jobs. Uh, and so, can you tell us, um, you know, what are maybe some of the missing opportunities that we have uh, in Appalachia uh, that uh, that your affiliated trade groups uh, that see on the horizon? Yeah, and I, I appreciate the administration. Uh, prioritizing that. I mean, you know, labor, in my opinion, some may disagree, but, you know, it's the backbone of the of the middle class. And, you know, we like to think that when we negotiate good contracts that, you know, we lift up all the ships around us, so to speak. And there wouldn't be a mate one as we know it today had the UMWA, you know, not organized coal miners down there and they negotiated uh, you know, good job, good paying jobs with benefits. So it is critically important that the jobs and opportunities out there are are family sustain, sustaining jobs. Uh, so you look, there's going to be uh, lots of changes. We've undergone a lot of changes already. Uh, we're still going to go through them, and uh, there's no question about that. But I I believe you know there was a question earlier about. A different panel about what our greatest asset is, and to me, it's the people. And we've been known around the world uh, for many years about our work ethic. Yeah, we have some issues with drugs and other things. There's no question about it. But at the end of the day, in my opinion, what's best about our state is our people. And our people can step up to the plate. We'll roll our sleeves up. We'll get dirty if we need to to provide opportunities for our family. And we welcome the seat at the table to do that moving forward. So, uh, yeah, we're we're ready for the challenge. Well, Josh, thank you so much, and and uh, Elizabeth and Jim, I really appreciate this uh, this conversation about our our workforce. Um, I do think it's one of the greatest assets uh, that uh, the region has. Coal power plant energy communities across the country. Uh, have this asset and and certainly it runs in spades across Appalachia. So thanks again uh, for this conversation. And, and again, I have the bad job of having to cut it off and move on to the next topic um, is, uh, you know, viewed as one of the key backbones of the future economy is, is access to broadband. Uh, I want to have a, a, a quick panel with uh, uh, Mary Hunt and Jason Roberts uh, on how we are not just expanding broadband access, the needs and how it can really be used to drive economic diversification uh, in general. And so uh, again, Mary, thanks, uh, uh, thanks, thanks, and wel welcome back to the stage. And and Jason, uh, good to meet you. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass it to you first, if you don't mind, Jason. Um, what is the the viewpoint in region in at, at Region One Planning and Development Council about some of our opportunities to use broadband access to help economic diversification. Well, thank you, Brian. I, I really appreciate being on the panel. And you know, the the answer to that question is kind of two two folds here. Uh, we work with our local EDA partners to really get sites ready and prepared for what we traditionally think of as commercial, you know, commercial businesses, you know, heavy, heavy industry, large data users. You know, and that's certainly an important tool for economic diversification, regardless if you're talking about coal mining, coal support industries, or anything, you know, anything completely different. But the other thing we need we need to think about is is people, you know, like we've all had to do, like you know, Mary and I are obviously sitting working from home, and so that's that's a big a big a big contrib big factor in really helping to diversify the economy. 
you know, we, we as we all compete against each other in terms of counties and states trying to get new new residents and remote workers to locate to our you know to our communities we can't do that if we don't have the ability to have adequate service when you're sitting at home on your back deck speaking about a panel on broadband or anything else and so i think we all need to really have the mindset of we can't operate in a silo. You know, I think people, communities have a tendency to think, well, I, I just need to get fiber within my community. Well, that's okay, but the real benefit, the real value of broadband is actually the bandwidth. So broadband and the internet, it's almost like a potable water system. It has to come from somewhere and go to somewhere. So in order to really diversify our economies and really enable remote working, entrepreneurship, whatever, we have to have an eye towards bringing in bandwidth. And that necessitates looking outside of our community boundaries. You know, broadband cannot stop at a municipal boundary or a county boundary or a state boundary. And so one of the things that we've been able to do at Region 1 and working with Region 4 and Rock and actually with the Benedum and Generation West Virginia is look outside those municipal boundaries and county boundaries. And that has really paid dividends in in generating a lot of projects in the hopper. And so we've actually are partnering with entities uh, outside of West Virginia. You know, we're having to bring bandwidth in from Virginia down in the Southern coal fields here of the state. And that's really what we need to do to set the stage for our local EDA people and our workforce people, you know, to have a platform to build diversification on. J Jason, thank you so much. and and. You know, uh, uh, Brandon Dennison was on here. Um, you know, I, I, he'll be on, on the next panel. But uh, you know, the folks at Coalfield Development are building, a, you know, a lot of capability that is built on the backbone of having uh, internet access, having broadband, uh, and uh, it is, in, in my view, just key and necessary infrastructure. It's uh, again part of our IWG portfolio. But Mary, I know that the uh, the Bindon Foundation also uh, uh, is in this game. Uh, real interest in developing um, some of the new opportunities uh, that come along with with broadband and and uh, and getting at the the final mile even. So, Mary, um, what are some thoughts around uh, the opportunities that that can be opened up? Well, you know, Jason gave you you know sort of the nuts and bolts of what broadband is. If we don't have it, we're not in the game, so to speak. And I think it's 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 become an interest. I think every one of the 430 participants on this call can tell you how important it is to them. So it's almost like we are we are the choir, we need to be the choir, we need to, you know, make the choir sing louder and louder. But I think the the issue is, you know, broadband is the equity issue of our day for rural America. And especially in, and we'll speak about at home in West Virginia and Central Appalachia, and where we have to get broadband to communities in order for the workforce that was spoken about in the last panel and the communities spoken about in the prior panels to be able to have individuals both educate online, be able to, to conduct commerce online, to be able to do entrepreneurial, the you know expansion of of, uh, of marketing and reach audiences and reach markets. It's just everything that this platform has got to enable relative to the development that we seek to have. And, and broad, this cannot occur slowly. I mean, already it's been too slow. Each time we have a conversation, folks are saying, oh, this is, you know, it's going to take time. We have to accelerate this. And, we, and that's why I think this federal investment is so valuable because it's, it is a private business space. And to the extent that we can help motivate the private business space to expand with the federal investments and state investments and philanthropic investments to really accelerate and amplify, it puts us in some type of level playing field with the rest of the world. And that is so essential. It's almost like every other conversation has to have this conversation in it. Uh, I know. Jason and I are able to, to preach this because we sort of wake up every day thinking about uh, this and how we can advance this. And he, as he mentioned, it's about projects. We have to devise projects, put them together. It's not sexy work. It's fundamental work. But all of us that are on this call need to wake up learning, thinking more about broadband because it's integral to everything else we're trying to do. 
And the more that we can educate you know, the wider audience about investing in this, sort of smoothing out the rules and regulations that are maybe impeding development that, that we're learning, let's make those changes so that we can accelerate that. It's just essential in order to make all these other things happen that we want to happen. Well, <laughs> Mary and Jason, I, we definitely hear you loud, loud and clear and, and firmly agree. The, um, you know, part of uh, within the interagency working group, part of our efforts are around stakeholder engagement, and it is absolutely critical for us that we have the connectivity. Uh, and I mentioned just the other day, we were in quote, in quote, in Arizona, in the Navajo and, and Hopi nations, where they have real issues in, in broadband access. And so most of our folks were on, on the telephone, not on web access for sure. And, and we have that same issue across Appalachia. And so, um, you know, we in the IWG definitely, definitely heard it. I know the ARC is, is right on board here too. And I think that it is just really a fundamental, like, it's like potable water. Um, and so if we think about it like water and sewer today, uh, that is, that is about our, our economy in the future. And, and, uh, Jason, thank you so much for, for joining us and, and Mary, thanks for jumping back on again as well. This is uh, really important and, and we're going to keep, keep turning on it for sure. So thank thank you both and and yep. uh, with with that um, we're going to shift to our, our next topic uh, fostering entrepreneurship. It came up earlier uh, within our discussion around uh, downtowns and communities. Um, and before we do, we're going to share a video about Appalachian Bot Botanical, uh, which is located in Ashford, West Virginia. They're taking a pretty creative approach to using reclaimed co coal mines. Uh, again, as we talked about before, but to grow lavender for culinary and body care products, uh, real high end, uh, high value products. So let's roll the video on on Appalachian Botanicals. A lot of people around here used to be employed in the mines and about a decade ago, the mines started shutting down. Something to remember about coal mining jobs is you could end up making $70,000 a year and driving a nice truck and having a nice house and sending your kids to college. And when the coal mining jobs dried up, a lot of that opportunity also dried up. It just disappeared. My name is Jocelyn Shepard and I'm the founder and president of Appalachian Botanical Company. Lavender is really one of the most versatile herbs that you'll come across. For one thing, it's pretty when it blooms. It smells great. And it can be used in a wide variety of applications for body care, for aromatherapy. Uh, it's great in tea and in different types of foods. We are here on what was a strip mine. And when we first came here, before we put the first plant in the ground, what we saw was uh, grass and scrubby trees and lots of weeds and giant boulders. You could tell that nothing productive was being done with this land. Our lavender grows in rocky soil that it has very few nutrients. I mean, when we plant, we use a little bit of chicken fertilizer and that is, that is it. We have approximately 35 acres of lavender under cultivation. And here in this high tunnel, we are surrounded by approximately 35,000 starter plants that will go in the ground starting around May 1st. We have approximately 30 employees and we project we're gonna get up around 60 at the peak of the season when we need the most help with weeding and harvesting. One of the reasons that this project and then this business has been so important to me is there are people out there who need second chances and while maybe they've made some bad decisions in life, it's really not entirely their fault that they were born into poverty or born into an area where the jobs are few and far between. And so helping them come back from the problems that they've experienced so that they can be productive members of society, that is an extremely attractive proposition to me. He does, he makes his rounds, he knows how to do it. My name's Adam Mitchell. I'm a crew lead here at Appalachian Botanical. So I'm from a, a small town here in Boone County. It's a rough part of town. There's not too much to do. Uh, other than get in trouble. And I made bad decisions on top of bad decisions and 
ultimately, you know, put me in jail. I've been in and out of jail since I was about 12 years old. Appalachian Botanical is a really great company. They, they don't hold your past against you. They're only worried about what, what you can do for yourself and for the company. They want to help you succeed. It's literally and figuratively a purple project. The fields here will be beautiful. And at the same time, it's purple in the way that when red state voters and blue state voters come together, they all support this lavender project. They all support the creation of jobs and opportunity in Boone County in southern West Virginia. Thank you so much to Appalachian Botanicals for, for that video and, and uh, um, touching on a few of the topics, uh, reclaimed mines, uh, revitalizing work, the workforce itself, and being entrepreneurial. And so our next, our next panel is about uh, fostering entrepreneurship. Uh, so inviting back uh, Jenna Belcher, Brandon Dennison, and Stephanie Tyree, uh, uh, thank you so much for uh, all of your engagement uh, this morning. And so when we think about uh, the um, new economy, the future economy, the diversified economy in Appalachia, um, what role can entrepreneurship itself uh, play? And so Jenna, I'll, I'll ask you to, to start. Um, what role can entrepreneurship play in, in a diversified economy? Sure. So as we've learned through our West Virginia Hive programming, um, we really recognize the the um, impact that an entrepreneurship community brings, especially to a regional approach. So again, representing a very diverse landscape in Southern West Virginia, in our counties, we know that each of them brings a unique perspective to the region. Some of them are more industrial, but then some of them, especially our gateway communities leading to the National Park, um, really ha embody this um, environment for cultivating these entrepreneurs. And so our West Virginia Hive initiative um, is a little bit unique in the, and it was created by the ARC investment originally in 2016. Um, and so it's really unique in that it provides one-on-one, -on -one very intentional business coaching and advising to work and handhold those entrepreneurs. And so, you know, entrepreneurship is really not something that can be taught, but those business components um, that oftentimes entrepreneurs don't possess are things that we need to, to help um, teach them. And so we're fortunate that we have on staff business advisors to do that. Additionally, um, another component that we're recognizing as it relates to entrepreneurship and, and even um, how our entrepreneurship initiative really cultivates business retention and expansion is that um, a, you know a lot of times uh, just providing actual technical assistance to these in the form of, of funding and cost sharing um, really allows these entrepreneurs to move their business and scale it. So we like to use, um, you know, we get some of these entrepreneurs at their ideation phase and we incubate them to the point of acceleration. And so really having that actual funding available to help support cost sharing, um, web design or marketing or um, accounting support, legal work, IP work is um, really important to, to help foster and grow those entrepreneurs into successful business owners that ultimately end up employing others. And so we, we just really recognize that importance um, in that culture across the communities in the region. Jenna, thank, thank you so much. And so, so true when we think about, um, you know, we can all who are on this call, put our collective minds together, come up with some, maybe some great ideas about uh, new businesses across Appalachia. But when we enable the thousands of individuals who may have a desire to be entrepreneurial, that's when we're really able to tap into it. So Brandon, I'm gonna I wanna ask you, how can we how how can we support and catalyze entrepreneurs across Appalachia? I, I think social entrepreneurship is is really important here. So when I say a, a social enterprise or a social entrepreneur, they're really sort of blending a, a social mission from the nonprofit world with the earned revenue stream, a market strategy from the for-profit world, and therefore blending revenue streams some earned revenue, some grant revenue and funding streams, you know, some loan capital and some grant capital. So that mixing and melding is really critical. I, I think social entrepreneurship 
it, it meets our economy where it is. I, I think about it as a bridge. You know, I think we would all love to have a thriving private sector entrepreneurial mecca. I think we can get there, but we're a long ways from there right now. And so I think we need some creative uh, entrepreneurship strategies that that really meet people where they are. I think sometimes entrepreneurship is treated like a silver bullet. Um, it's it's not a silver bullet. It's it's not for everyone. It it it, it alone cannot reemploy everyone that needs reemployed. And yet, there's no way we're going to build the new economy we need without it. It's 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 the it's the X factor. Uh, it, you know, it's the uh, we, 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 we just can't do it with, without it. Um, and so I think social entrepreneurship is an interesting way to blend a couple different models together, meet the economy where it is, but also meet our people where they are. I, I would totally call Appalachian Botanicals a social enterprise, a great social enterprise that we, we do business with proudly. Um, and when you heard the, the employee talking on the video, you know, he's talking about mistakes that he's made, challenges that he's facing. Uh, and so a social enterprise, I think, can be a little bit more patient with a challenged workforce that has faced a lot of barriers uh, to build the confidence up, to build the skill sets up, uh, and to get a workforce back on track in a way that maybe a purely private approach doesn't have the luxury uh, to be able to, to afford. Brandon, thank you. One thing that, that comes to mind is uh, it sounds complicated. Uh, if you're you're blending funding streams, you're building blending revenue streams. It's a lot to manage. I mean, again, you know, I'll give the IWG plug is what one thing we're trying to do is make the barrier lower to accessing the federal funds, creating one stop shop sort of sort of approach. And as Stephanie in our roundtable in June, we talked about uh, that being one of the big the big barriers is to change the way and innovate the way the federal government does does business. So how do we continue to support? the entrepreneurs uh, in Appalachia in West Virginia, um, because it is a complicated enterprise to, to try to venture out and start your own business or even jump on board with a, a you know, a, a small company that you, if you're one of the first employees, you're not sure if that, how long that's going to last. So what, um, what, what could be that uh, support that we can help provide communities and, and entrepreneurs? Sure. So um, this is such an interesting conversation because we're all kind of approaching the idea of entrepreneurship a little bit differently and the way, but it all melds together. And the way that I think about entrepreneurship is uh, entrepreneurship is being entrepreneurial as the way that you think and you act and you approach your work. And so it's about creating something new where you see there's a need and you have a passion and commitment to do that. And so when we talk about entrepreneurial development in the region, it's all different kinds of things. It's individual businesses, it's social enterprises. Um, something we're talking about at the very beginning of the first panel was entrepreneurial developers for rural building development strategies. So uh, the other thing that I think about when we're talking about entrepreneurial approaches is the federal partners doing their work in an entrepreneurial way and thinking about what are the barriers that we're facing in our region that we need support with and what are new creative strategies to address those barriers. And I think that in some ways is the magic of ARC's power program is it's really understood some of the critical barriers that we face in the region and the need to work with anchor institutions to drive federal resources to the most high need, highly distressed communities in the region. Like Laura was saying in the first panel, capital flows to the places where it's easiest, like water, but where it's most needed are the places that it is the most difficult to drive it towards. And that's not just capital, but that's workforce development, business development, community and economic development. And so for the federal funding to have the transformational impact that I know that this administration is seeking, it's really got to, we have all, you have all have to, you have to think about how to proactively drive resources to the places where capital doesn't flow easily. So that means working with the institutions on the ground that have the highest capacity to take federal resources and distribute them out to rural communities and help grow capacity of organizations, businesses, entrepreneurs in those communities. 
And what's been amazing to see happen in the power program over the last five years is seeing capacity growth within organizations that are now able to receive federal funds themselves and they're anchored in those small towns. So I think that we need to keep doing what we're doing, use power as a model for other federal funding approaches, but also we have to all work together really as a team from the federal level to the regional and state and local level to understand what are some of those systemic barriers to federal investments in distressed communities and what are creative approaches that we're going to have to put in place to build the pathways to get the investment to flow to the places that we want to see it. Stephanie, thank you. And th I mean, this, this is absolutely great. And all three of you, the hub, the hive, uh, Coalfield Development, um, the, the work that you're doing um, is exactly, you know, like, like we're saying, trying to support uh, the entrepreneurs, trying to support the communities, do the capacity building, and also building capacity in, in, in the communities. So just quickly, I'm going to pass it around. Same question for all three of you. What would be a piece of advice to other organizations, other leaders, other community organizers, developers, what's the, a, a real piece of advice to be successful uh, in supporting entrepreneurs and diversifying an economy? Uh, Jenna, I'll start with you. So I think the piece of advice um, that would come from some of the experiences that we've had with the HAV is that this isn't a package together um, program that can be deployed easily in other places and replicated. And so we do have a lot of folks that see the success of the HAV and the model that it uses and want to replicate that in their communities. But it it might not work the way that we've gotten it to work. And so the piece of advice that I would give is to really um, connect with the leadership that has developed these programs across the state to see what challenges they face to get them to the point that they're at now. I know with the Hive specifically, again, um, we sort of have that unique approach to providing direct funding and technical assistance deployment to those entrepreneurs, and it has worked, but that's come with a lot of trial and error. That's come with a lot of cost share modeling. That's come with a lot of intellectual property that we've developed while also fundraising and becoming a sustainable entity. So again, I think that um, going back to what I've mentioned on the other panel with that holistic approach to economic development, you really have to look at what the full big picture is and not just focus on the entrepreneur. Um, but where does that entrepreneur and that um, the growth of the entrepreneurship sector fit into the larger um, approach for the region? And so um, I, I would just encourage someone to reach out to folks that have done this on a regional level and really just discuss rather than seeing the successes and attempting to duplicate in their communities. Uh, thank you, Jenna. And Brandon, what would be some advice you give? I, I would agree with that, certainly. And I think. In addition, it's important to, to to move fast and moving fast doesn't mean you have to do everything you want to do all at once. So you, you can be testing ideas and testing products and, and testing market opportunities at the same time as you're gathering information, researching other approaches and being thoughtful and, and developing your plans. I think sometimes we get stuck in that planning phase. And we feel like we got to have it all lined out exactly what we're going to do in all these different scenarios. And the reality is you can't think of all those different scenarios and, and the learning will never be as valuable as it is once once you're testing and ideating and, 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 and iterating. Now, that so makes, be, that so makes be sense. thoughtful, but move fast. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it fell early. Um, it's cheaper to fell early than fell late. Um, there you go. <laughs> but, but you do, as, as, as Jenna said, I mean, Perseverance and patience too uh, play a role there. And so, Stephanie, uh, last uh, last word. What have, what what are some words of advice you'd give? So, I want to link it back to um, Mate Juan uh, since we started there this morning. And this is a piece of advice that I got from a community member in Mate Juan about a dozen years ago, and it's really directed my work in um, in a sort of foundational way since then. And they told me that. Trust is gained by the thimbleful and it's lost by the bucketful. And I think the reason I say that is because our success is going to be built on trusting partnerships. And we have to build partnerships across sectors, across regions, 
and across uh, sort of organizational entities, federal agencies, nonprofits, <clears throat> private partners, all really intentionally building relationships of trust with each other in order to support each other, in order to grow the pie, like Brandon was saying before, and to think about the work that we're doing together as bigger than a single project, bigger than a set of years, um, and really it's about generational work that we're doing together and committing to it for the long term, knowing that we are trying to transform a region that uh, is looking at generational change and seeing ourselves as part of that generational leadership. And I think if we think about that and we build that trust with each other and really work collaboratively together, we'll stay, we'll stay inspired in the work and we can make unbelievable things happen. Well, Stephanie, thank you much. I, I am, I really am inspired uh, this morning. This has been, you know, just a terrific conversation. I'm, I'm so glad to, to close out this conversation with Jim and Brandon and Stephanie. Thank you so much. Um, and, uh, and I really appreciate all the work that you're doing uh, on behalf of the interagency working group on behalf of 11 different federal agencies, all with a singular vision to um, to revitalize our coal power plant to energy communities. Um, it is it is a um, sincerest thanks to those who participated in the panels this morning, and my deepest thanks to the Appalachian Regional Commission and, and Co-Chair Mansion. Uh, this is this has really been incredible, and I, I'm I'm inspired. Gail, thank you for the opportunity to let me moderate. Uh, it, as noted in the in the comments, uh, somebody in the chat noted it seems like I was having fun, and I certainly am. Uh, so, Gail, thank you so much. Oh, Brian, thank you. You did an excellent job of moderating. Uh, you kept us right on the time schedule, and yet, uh, amazing uh, comments, insights, expertise, evaluation of the great work that's going on around our communities. I, just like you, have been very inspired by what I've seen and heard today, and. I also want to thank everyone that served on the panel and contributed to the to our insights that we have received today. And so uh, as we move forward again, Brian, thank you. It is such a pleasure and an honor to serve on the uh, interagency government working mission uh, committee. I, it's a long name. I <laughs> mess it up every time I say it. But uh, we're so proud to be partners with you in this work. Uh, and so we move forward today uh, as we continue our, our work here in, in Mate Uh But before uh, we move on to our 2021 power announcements and our grantees, we want to show a video of our uh, snapshots of exactly what power is. We we talked about it. Several of the panelists had mentioned work with the grants uh, during their, their conversation. But to show a little bit about what power is, what it does, and the impact that it has had and is having in our coal impacted communities. Uh, this project, the competitive power grant, began in 2015. And then, in addition to the video about our power grants, we are also will be hearing a special message from our two uh, great West Virginia senators, our bipartisan working senators, uh, Senator Shelley Moore Capito and Senator Joe Manchin. Thank you. And the video, please.
thank you for inviting me to join you in this exciting announcement today. The Appalachian Regional Commission is an important partner for our state, and I'm proud to be a champion for them in the United States Senate. I'm also proud that our own Gail Manchin is our first West Virginia co-chair of the ARC. It's quite an accomplishment. ARC power grants in particular play an incredibly important role in spurring economic development in the Mountain State. They also help to move our state forward, and I'm proud to see West Virginia receive the highest number of grants from such a competitive program. Between my Capito Connect program and my position as the top Republican on the EPW committee that oversees ARC, I have worked hard to steer investments into West Virginia. Projects like the Pocahontas Broadband Project have been major priorities for me and will help better connect the areas of our state that still lack reliable internet access. None of these projects would be possible without you. You, the local leaders and stakeholders on the ground, you see the challenges that face your community every single day. And together we are working to resolve those issues. Investments like this one help make West Virginia and Appalachia as a whole, a better, stronger, and more connected place. Again, thank you for your dedication to your communities your diligence, perseverance, and hard work has made today's announcements possible. Hello, I'm United States Senator Joe Manchin. Although I wish we could have gathered today in person in beautiful Matewan, I am so very proud to be part of today's program and power grant announcements. I appreciate Secretary Granholm, my lovely wife, ARC co-chair Gail Manchin, my dear friend and colleague, Senator Shelley Moore Capito, Interagency Working Group on Coal Executive Director Brian Anderson, Mayor of Matewan, Matt Moore, and the many local and state leaders who work so hard for our state and nation. I'm proud to be part of this initiative and to highlight Matewan, a small town in West Virginia coal fields of Mingo County. Like so many of our towns across West Virginia that have mined the coal that powered our nation, Matewan holds a special place in our heritage. What makes Matewan and all of West Virginia so special is its people. As JFK said, President Kennedy, the sun doesn't always shine in West Virginia, but our people always do. And I know that we are shining today. I will always stand alongside the hardworking people of our state. That is why I have always believed and still believe that the government needs to work as our partner, not an adversary, especially when it comes to producing energy in this country. The fact is coal currently generates almost 20% of the electricity in America, providing reliable energy at affordable prices. And West Virginia exports that base load power to other states who need it. While some might want to focus on elimination, I believe that we need to focus on innovation so that we can continue to use our abundant natural resources in a clean way and maintain that reliable, affordable, and dependable power our economy relies on. We also need to advance new, innovative ways to use our coal for high value products, like for computer chips that will bring new revenue streams to the state. In addition to all that, coal miners themselves are some of the bravest and most patriotic men and women that I have ever met. And it is always an honor to fight for our coal heritage and our way of life that sinks deep into the roots of West Virginia's rich culture. For decades, our coal miners have worked hard every day to produce the energy that lights our cities and heats our homes. And I hope that our miners know that I will always proudly stand by their side. And now, as chairman of the Senate's Energy and Natural Resources Committee, I intend to assure this progress has continued. The problems facing our country are serious, and I'm committed to working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to find common sense solutions for long-term comprehensive energy policy that incorporates an all of the above strategy 
and ensures our state and our nation are our leaders in the energy future. We know here in West Virginia that when we work together, we can overcome any obstacle to move our state and nation forward. We've seen these efforts thrive, even among the unprecedented challenges that we've seen this past year. One of the key ways that we meet these challenges is by setting our priorities based on our values. Knowing how much we love our great state and the small towns and communities that made us who we are. Today, we are celebrating 57 power projects, totaling $46.4 million. This is the largest power announcement in the six years of the program. Of this group, there are 14 grants for West Virginia, totaling $12.3 million for the state. This year, there are more power grantees in West Virginia than in any other state. The West Virginia grantees range from cybersecurity workforce training to broadband deployment of downtown revitalization to planning grants for youth entrepreneurship and trail system development. West Virginia will also participate in several larger regional projects designed to increase access to capital for small and growing Appalachian businesses. These grants will help dozens of communities across West Virginia create stronger local economies and a promising future for our people. I look forward to witnessing the benefits of these awards for our state in the years to come. Thank you all and God bless you. Thank you, Senator Manchin. Thank you, Senator Manchin and Senator Capito. And some of the information that Senator Manchin uh, stated, I think it's important enough that we need to reiterate it. Yes, uh, we are pleased that ARC is providing uh, a little over $46 million for 57 projects across 184 counties and, uh, that, and all of this area has been impacted by the downturn of the coal industry. This is indeed the largest power grant package in ARC history that we are getting ready to announce today since its inception in 2015. The power projects that are being announced today leverage entrepreneurship, workforce development, and infrastructure to bolster re-employment opportunities, create jobs in existing or new industries, and attract new sources of investment. And more importantly, these projects will leverage regional partnerships and collaboration to have impact across county and state lines. We've heard that all day today, about the importance of building relationships, about the importance partnerships and collaborations from local, county, regional, uh, state, and across state borders. You know, it's also important to note, and this was on a couple of the slides that was just shown, but uh, a new report that just came out that the projects funded through our competitive power grants have met or exceeded uh, the jobs retained, created, business created, workers trained, or revenues increased. So uh, it, it, it certainly to congratulate uh, those grants that have come before us that in the work, there was commitment, there was dedication, there has been success. So thank you to all of our former grant recipients. And now, without any further delay, we are pleased to announce our 57 projects and grantees. Hold the video.
congratulations to all of our 2021 power grantees. We certainly look forward to seeing the transformative energy and change in our region's coal impacted communities. ARC will be announcing some additional power grantees later this year. Um, so more to come on that. And uh, so please also be on the alert for our 20, 2022 announcement on um, for the RFPs. Again, let me take one more opportunity to thank all of the people that made today's events possible, including Presidents Biden's IWG, people that participated on participants, all of our friends from the town of Maitlawn in West Virginia, and to the people on the ARC staff that brought all of our videos and people together so successfully working with uh, Dr. Anderson at NETL. And the thank you to, more importantly, to all of the people that tuned in today to join us in sharing the stories of what is going on in, in our Appalachian region, to share the concerns and challenges of many of the people that live in our coal impacted communities. But knowing that working together, building those most important partnerships and collaborations, that we can transform, not just help communities to survive, but to thrive, to grow, to bring a better quality of life across our Appalachian region. And so with all of my friends and colleagues and staff that here, everyone that made today possible. Thank you. Thank you for your commitment and dedication. Thank you for your hard work and commitment to our federal partners. We are looking so forward to working with you as we move our Appalachian Region Commission together forward and change the face of coal impacted communities across our country. Thank you.